Hey, Crispy, love your videos. They help me get through work and farming Destiny 2. A man after my own heart. But anyways, I have a problem on my hands. One of my players has been a problem and I need some advice. I DM over at my friend's apartment, let's call him Warlock, and two mutual friends, but the one that's important to the story is Fighter. A couple months ago, I hit up my D&D group that I planned on starting a new campaign and they seemed pretty excited about it. So I felt confident that it was gonna be a good one. Fast forward through months of planning and preparation and we're at session zero and I'm getting everything settled at the start of the campaign. So I ask Fighter for his backstory and he says he just doesn't have one. Uh, no problem, I think to myself. I can help him out real quick. I ask him if he has an idea, what he wants his story to be about, and he says he doesn't know. I ask him if there's anything his character values and nothing. Okay, I ask him what his character's goals were and he just didn't. No. God. Hey man, look, I really need your backstory. It's been like three weeks since we started the game. You've done nothing at all with your character. Can you just give me anything? Are you? <sighs> Do you ever look at someone and wonder what is going on inside their head? Hello? This explains a lot. Wait. How do I get out of here? I was a bit confused at this point because I announced the campaign months back and he didn't even have an idea of a backstory, much less what his character was about. I told him straight up, look, I need a couple sentences about what your character wants to achieve in her lifetime. I'm trying to help you, but you're not even meeting me halfway. He tells me he'll send it to me later. So we get the campaign going, I gave an okay dude, and we got rolling. He eventually gave me a backstory, albeit half ass but hey, at least it's something. Now, I run my games on my day off, and the day after, that's when Warlock runs his game with Fighter and their friends. And Fighter has been constantly flip-flopping between leaving the campaign and staying. My friend essentially told him that he has to choose one because he can't constantly plan stuff and replan them when he decides he wants to drop out now. And he has done the same thing to me before, and I told him the exact same thing, to choose if he wants to leave or not, because I can't change things on the fly for when he decides he wants to leave and he won't let me know in advance. But one day, Warlock isn't feeling up to DMing or whatever, and Fighter essentially tries to guilt trip Warlock into running the campaign, and he tells me this, and both of us drop him from the campaigns, and he's trying to apologize over his actions, over call and text, but I'm not sure if I should let him back in. What should I do? Look, you know this guy better than I do, but it is frustrating when somebody is just not willing to commit. It's okay to not commit, but you can't pretend like you are committing and then drop last second. That is when things become a problem. On top of the guilt tripping, yeah, from my perspective, it's not looking good. If you want to give him another chance, that's on you. But from my angle, it's not looking like this guy's worth it, man. Some of my players are on the verge of quitting my game, and I can hardly blame them. We've been playing for only a couple months, and loot has already gotten so stagnant. I need a way to satisfy my little loot goblins. Thank God, I found Dungeon Decks and the Vault of Wonders. This week's videos are sponsored by Dungeon Deck and their new Kickstarter, Falco's Vault of Wonders. There are so many places to get unique magic items in Dungeons and Dragons, but Dungeon Dex takes things to a whole new level. First and foremost, the cards look amazing. Each item is incredibly illustrated, perfectly visualizing exactly what the item is with so many unique illustrations. Like take the Phantom Fang, a dagger that allows you to teleport instantly on a critical hit and turn invisible, turning your rogue into a real ghost. I cannot stress enough that in dungeon decks, from the most simple uncommon item to the most legendary artifact, every item tells a story. Each one can serve as the catalyst for an entire quest, or be characters all on their own. Put simply, if you're tired of plus one longswords, dungeon decks, 
it's the clear way to go. If you guys are interested, then you can head down into the description down below or to the pinned comment so you can check out this Vault of Wonders from Dungeon Dex. Hey, if you're watching this on release day, the Kickstarter doesn't launch until tomorrow, but you still have time to get notified right when it comes out and reserve one of the card decks for just one dollar. But no matter when you're watching this video, this is an amazing Kickstarter. Make sure to check it out. As always, supporting our sponsors does support us. And without further ado, I'm going to turn back into an animated rat so that we can get back to the video. Hi, I just stumbled onto your channel a month or so ago, probably from the Baldur's Gate 3 Dimension 20 and Critical Role algorithm, and I'm kind of loving it. Thank you, by the way. It's good to have a queer-friendly place to share horror stories from tabletop sessions. Anyway, I've been for the most part a forever dungeon master since my second year playing back in middle school, and then switched over to mainly more short-form tabletop like Fiasco for a few years after college. So during the pandemic, I wanted to get back into tabletop, and Discord games were becoming a huge thing. One of my partners, we'll call him Thrall, wanted to get back into tabletop after a bad experience with a rules lawyering min-maxer when he was young, and that put him off. And my other partner, we'll call Gail, wanted to try for the first time with a friend of mine, we'll call Susie. The dungeon master was a guy we'll call DM Art. They're a nice enough guy my partners and I had roomed with at a con before, has a wife and kids, seems really chill, which kind of is why what happened in his game threw us for a loop so hard. So he told us he would love to DM a campaign, which sounded great. He told us it would be high fantasy and not much else. Ugh, stop doing that! I'll have a... A high fantasy world. Our original. That's basically just Azeroth, or Tamriel, or Exandria, or Middle-earth. Daring today, aren't we? My homebrew world is also definitely like this, by the way, so no shame on doing something typical of fantasy. But make sure to describe things a little bit. Saying just high fantasy doesn't give anything for your players to work with. Anyway, yeah, we weren't given much, but really, for a game with mostly beginner players, it's all we need. A sandbox is a great way to start off with. The first issue, though, was that I kept flip-flopping between Pathfinder and 5th edition, which made keeping track of stats weird. I mainly play for roleplay, and my own sessions aren't combat-heavy, so I thought maybe his weren't either. Not a big deal. Anyway, by this point, we're only a few sessions in. So I am a huge Laura Bailey fan. Jaina Proudmoore has been my favorite Warcraft character since I was about 12 years old. Is it because of titties? <laughs> I'm kidding. Sometimes you get the feminine urge to love a character who's sexy and sad. Laura Bailey was Jaina Proudmoore's voice actress in the MMO, and it made my life complete as a big anime fan who loved her in Dragon Ball Z, Fruit Basket, Full Metal Alchemist, etc. And then, when Critical Role started getting big, I noticed she played a lot of characters I could really relate to as well. Thrall, my partner, admires Travis Willingham as a husband, businessman, and actor, as well as loving good aligned orcs, so together we decided to base our character concept on a bit of Ford and Jester, but with our own preferences in mind, so we had a half-orc fighter and a tiefling sorceress who would end up in a relationship together by the end of the story. We specified we wanted the experience of growing our relationship over the course of the story, and DM Art said that that would be fine. Gail chose to play a half-wood elf ranger because she's a fan of more martial classes and also is a fan of the Windrunner sisters in World of Warcraft. Susie chose to play a fire genasi rogue with a criminal background who was also an orphan. Her character was the youngest at 16 years old. The rest of us are adults. Also, Susie herself is half the DM's age, though still an adult in real life. Keep this in mind. So, the first issue came when Thrall and I were introduced. We were introduced as already having been in a relationship and explicitly having been together before the Dungeon Master openly jokes about it and kind of slut shames my character. Does the DM happen to be a kicker for the Kansas City Chiefs? Oh! I got him! A month late, but I got him! He's been got! Shaming my character like that also just made no sense. 19 or 20 and had lived with her very protective adoptive parents until literally getting separated from her mother's crew at port during a raid just before the story began and only having met Thrall's character when he pulled her out of a crushing crowd. Gail's character is introduced and then largely ignored by the Dungeon Master. After Susie joins the party, the dreaded DMPC is introduced. 
Now, no shame on DMPCs, sometimes they can be useful, and sometimes I offer them to my own players as a sort of hireling if they decide, but the DMPC should never be the main focus of the story and driving the entire plot. This guy's DMPC, unfortunately, was the entire plot. So first and foremost, he joins our party and travels with us. And mind you, this character is in his 30s or 40s. That will unfortunately be important later on. Uh... As they travel, we are introduced to a wizard NPC who my character seems to connect with while viewing him as a potential mentor, considering he is very powerful and old. But he kind of just gives us some vague exposition about some Arthurian legend and then sends us on our way. One thing that really sticks out is that none of us are human, and this is a very human-centric lore dump that's being presented to us as something that is important to us. So the DMPC has, at this point, the second night camping, proceeding to be extremely weird towards Susie's character and flirting with her. The 16-year-old at his much bigger age gap, and all of us are really uncomfortable and also kind of sick of him, very slowly beginning to steer the spotlight away from our player characters, implying that he, the DMPC, has some sort of connection to this Arthurian legend. I learned early on you can't fix a problem by ignoring it and hoping for the best, so I talked to the other players and we decided to talk to the dungeon master and express our concern. He claimed he understood and wanted to be sure we had fun, so it seemed like his DMPC left our group. And that's the end of the story. All right, yeah, I'm cracking up. Woo, we got there, yeah! I'm only halfway done, aren't I? While we were in town, he had our party encounter some bandits. I'm very much a person who tries to solve things outside of combat, so I asked for some persuasion and intimidation roles as needed. On an 18 and a nat 20, he told me I gathered no information because the bandits were too afraid to speak both for my intimidation and persuasion checks. From a 5'2 purple tiefling with freckles and hair ribbons. Madam, please, I, I will do whatever you command. Please do not hurt me in your name. I, I, will, I will end my pillaging. In fact, should you command it, I will end my entire bloodline. For, for your terror could command me to do anything even the most horrifying of things. But please, just just let me go. I beg of you. Okay. He then introduced a bard inspired by a dandelion from The Witcher, who did nothing but sing about how awesome the DMPC had been and how he'd recently saved the town from dark riders at the cost of his own life. My tiefling and Gale's half-elf were not buying it and both told him gently with constructive criticism that the story sounded dull and one-man hero stories were passé nowadays and people were really craving to hear about the power of friendship and teamwork. The bard was kind of deflated but agreed with us and asked to follow us to gain more stories like that, which seemed like a step in the right direction until he just disappeared, never to be seen again, just kind of randomly. When we bedded down for the night, we were attacked by bandits again, and somehow none of our attacks seemed to hit them. And we just kind of had to sit there and listen as he described us being brutally killed until someone, a masked figure, suddenly shows up and fought them off. And oh, guess who that someone was? Yep, it was the, it was the DMPC, who somehow was secretly an ASMR all along with glowing gold wings. So he rejoined us, along with two bonus NPCs he described as basically Trevor Belmont and Saifel Belnades, and I'm very glad he told us that because I never would have guessed since all they did was back up his character and chastised us if we ever disagreed with him. Which <laughs> is the most out of character thing with Trevor and Saifa. Like Alucard, son of Dracula, would be the closest thing to this DMPC. Obviously a better character in the show, but go with me on this. And how does Trevor treat Alucard throughout the run of the show? Please, this isn't a bar fight. Have some class. Yeah, out of character. Anyway, we ended up getting railroaded into going to the Kingdom of Avalon, which had been taken over by a demon king, who for some reason were my tiefling's true parents, and Thrall's mother works for them too, and Susie's family also works for these people. Gale only avoided being roped into this because the dungeon master spent 90% of the game pretending she just didn't exist, which was on my last nerve at this point. 
ultimately the DMPC keeps trying to get us to help him overthrow these quote unquote villains who, here's the kicker, are nothing but nice and welcoming to us and show no signs of really doing anything except for feasting while he continues to hit on the 16 year old rogue and creepily trying to room with her whenever we bed down. So we've had enough of this creepy Mary Sue and Thrall, Gale and I see no reason not to tell the Demon King about who this guy is and what he's planning. And so he ends up throwing a fit and graphically describing how his DMPC is crucified to try and guilt our characters about not siding with him on whatever vague plot he was trying to get us to go with. I honestly just checked out at this point. I don't remember how the campaign ended, but he tried to get us all to do a sequel campaign where Thrall's character was killed, my character was abducted, and forced to be Strahd's bride. And I'm not sure how Strahd figured into any of this. And oh my god, the curse of Curse of Strahd strikes again. Even when we're not playing Curse of Strahd! The main character of the story was actually the child of his 40-something-year-old ASMR DMPC, and Susie's 16-year-old character from the last game... <laughs> we are in Code 9! Red Lord, don't you dare! Red Lord, Chris, don't you dare! Red Lord, Chris, don't you dare! Someone's gonna do it again! Someone's gonna do it again! Anyway, I've rarely been involved as anything, but the DM since then has been just a really crappy experience. But on the bright side, it didn't put Gale or Thrall off of playing, and while Thrall has since decided he wants to work behind the scenes, doing guest NPCs, running music, and providing written content for my games, Gale has really come into his own, proceeding to play a really silly, bubbly, Draenei warrior from my Warcraft High School AU game, and a foul mouth, rough around the edges, but motherly goblin swords bard for my Baldur's Gate 3 game. And you know what? Sounds great, dude. It's kind of funny because something similar to this happened in my own 10th Tomb actual play. I'll keep things vague for spoiler reasons, but essentially an NPC who was important to the plot got betrayed by one of the player characters and it created a really interesting PvP scenario. But the point is, I didn't take that personally. Okay, that NPC was designed to be on the fence in terms of morality. Like, I expected the players not to trust them. That made sense. Look, I understand liking the NPCs you create, but you gotta make sure to create NPCs that your players also like. And if you purposefully create a character who may rub players wrong, like, for example, casually creeping on them, then you have to expect the characters might not like that and might respond appropriately. This DM had so many problems, but that's one I see often, and one I kind of understand. I like my NPCs too, but I like my NPCs who are, you know, likable. I've had more than my share of RPG horror stories, but now that two campaigns are wrapped up completely, one sort of died out and I left a fourth one because my playstyle was not compatible with the DM and some of the players, I'll share this one. I ran a four year long campaign as the dungeon master that recently wrapped up. We started with 10 players. The game didn't really have high player attrition rate per se, but we did have players drop out due to work schedules, family issues, and life in general. The game started with, uh, Curse of Strahd! <sighs> Can't it be Horror the Dragon Queen being ruined by these stories? I like Curse of Strahd! But hey, for the most part, during Curse of Strahd, everything went pretty well. After Strahd's defeat, and the player characters leaving the pocket dimension, they get back to the Sword Coast, and I start trying to tie in their backstories and playing out character arcs with homebrew stuff. One player, who had some psychic powers, started invading minds for information, despite the fact that there were other ways to get it. Notably, she did this to a PTSD-inflicted cleric of Kelembor, who watched his best friends, lover, and siblings get torn apart by a massive horde and undead, and then forced alcohol down his throat when he reacted negatively to this. The character spent the rest of her arc being hunted down by the paladins of Kelembor for this act. The other was a mage. When threatened by a pair of ancient white dragons for casting fire spells in their cave after making friendly contact and later getting trapped in the cave by an avalanche, his reaction was, I'm going to hold an action to cast an 8th level fireball at the dragon's hatchlings? This was after having a discussion about how these six hatchlings were identical and how there was some weirdness going on because twins and triplets, etc. are when the two eggs are hatched at once, not when one dragon is hatched out of multiple different eggs at multiple times, by the dragons themselves. 
Then, the Psylocke used her skills to switch places with the threatened mage when he got trapped, only angering the dragons further. Needless to say, by this point, their faces had started to appear on wanted dead t-shirts and posters with a massive reward. But the mage doubled down when the dragons tracked him down to a ship on the water and attacked. He teleported away, leaving the rest of the party to deal with the dragons, which... Sensible. <laughs> When they were eventually outclassed and overwhelmed, and the paladin walked away in anger, refusing to protect them from the consequences of their own actions, they agreed to a trial, where they were punished by Kalimvor himself, in a way that limited their magic and abilities. One left the game the next session never to return, the other suffered a character death, and decided he was done, because he felt unfairly targeted by the dragons and others that he had offended. On behalf of this completely unofficial and probably not legal court system of Crispy Tavern, I find the defendant guilty on- Sir, I, I must object to these horrific accusations. I'm not really a judge, but I don't think you can object in the middle of- I'm, I'm clearly being unfairly targeted by, by a vindictive and terrible world and system. I did not actually do anything wrong. <laughs> Sir, you are not being unfairly targeted, okay? You chose to do actions that would piss people off. You can't be upset when people get pissed off. It's the natural consequence. I, I mean, look what I did. You know, n nothing actually illegal happened, and, and, and you know, I, I didn't have any bad intentions. Mr. Disrespect, you were still messaging a minor. It's still really creepy. Oh, come on! We finished out the game, but these incidents left a bad taste in my mouth, and they caused me to stop and step away from being the dungeon master for a while. Man, it has been some time since we've seen just an old school murder hobo. Put simply, stuff like this is a result of a few things, but I think directly it's a result of a DM not being able to tell their players what they expect out of the campaign. Like, look, if I create a campaign, it's probably a heroic campaign filled with tales of bravery against all odds. I tell my players that. Therefore, they have the expectation that I shouldn't make nor play a murder hobo in this campaign. Now, obviously, there are many players who just don't listen to that kind of thing. That's a whole other problem. But you do need to explain that. What's interesting is this doesn't seem to be a problem in Curse of Strahd. Maybe due to the direction of the module, the players felt like they had more urgency to be heroes. Maybe just because Strahd is such a massive incel, they really wanted to kill him. I don't know. What do you guys think? What created these murder hobos? I'll start by giving some disclaimers. I'm as much in the wrong as the actual problem players simply because I enabled it. This is the story of why I, as a dungeon master, now have a strict just no sexual at the table. But the most important thing to learn from this story is the importance to learn how to say no to your players. We're going back 10 years ago, I was 16, and only about a year into tabletop role-playing games as a player. I foolishly thought I could write my own system! Can't be that hard, right? Hey, how's your new system going? What even is the nature of a D20? I have spent the past five years pondering the true nature of tabletop gaming in order to perfect my system, and I haven't even written a single word upon my laptop. Okay, I'll uh, leave you to it. Call 911. It was inspired by a role-playing forum I was in at the time. I quickly put together a couple rules inspired from the tabletop role-playing game I was playing, Anima, Beyond Fantasy, if you were wondering, and in about a month, I declared my quote-unquote system playable, and wanted to DM my first ever campaign using these new rules. Session Zeros were a foreign concept to me and my group at the time, so we didn't have one. Bring him in. Your fault, not mine. Hey, isn't that like gaslighting or something? He's not dead yet? Initially, I invited four of my friends with changed names, Jen, Max, Fred, and Henry. Jen asked me if I could invite her boyfriend, John. I say, sure, why not? I knew the guy and thought he would be a nice addition. 
Max asks if he could invite three of his friends, Jack, Jerry, and Robert, since he also offered to use his grandma's living room to host the game. I agreed. He tried to push his luck by asking to add a certain Steph into the game, but I did not know this guy and told him so. I just got lucky he let it go because I was really about to say yes. If you count properly, that would make a party of eight players for my first ever campaign as a new dungeon master. Keep an eye on John, Henry, Fred, and Jerry. They're all going to be relevant later. To simplify everything, I'll translate the story using Dungeons & Dragons terms. So first, the party is invited to a new starting mercenary guild that was just opening business. To fully become members, the guild leader sends them out on wolf hunting missions. As a new dungeon master, I figured this would be a nice introduction to how combat worked. The party get to a nearby forest and then they start slaying wolves. So far, everything works out well, the players are having fun, but crap hits the fan when Fred, playing a wizard, critically fails his firebolt. Not knowing what to do at the time, I decide at random that the firebolt hits Jerry's character, a 10 year old girl barbarian. To make the scene feel like a fumble, I also add that now this little girl is on fire. She's now taking damage every turn. I feel like the friendly fire was enough of a fumble. But sure, burning the little girl's alive. That, that's, that's good. John's turn comes next, and he asks me if he could try and put the fire out. I ask how, and he answers, I want to pee on her. What his class was is irrelevant, but keep in mind that he was playing a grown adult man. Not knowing what to do, I make him roll to see if he even has that much fluid inside him, and he, he succeeds. I then declare that the little girl is not on fire anymore. Fred asks, hey, isn't there a consequence of any sort of having... <laughs> what? Why are you asking that? And being a 16 year old dude with no medical knowledge, I say, yeah, that makes sense. I guess the girl is poisoned until she cleans herself. The fight ends quickly after. At this point, we've been playing for about an hour and a half. I promised my players at least three hours, and my prep did go beyond that wolf fight, because I was dead sure that the party would roleplay a bit and fill in some gaps for me. So anyway, at this point, I call a quick break so I can improvise something quickly for that remaining time. During this break, Henry told us he brought snacks. Those snacks were jalapeno peppers that his parents grew at home. Nobody else wanted them, so we ate them all. There were like five or six, I can't really remember. Anyway, we all saw his face turn bright red and he started panicking, realizing what he had just done. Bro, you're like the this is fine dog, except you lit the house on fire yourself. This is all your fault. He then ran to the kitchen, Max's grandma's kitchen to remind you, and downed a whole two liter bottle of milk on his face. There was just milk everywhere. Max's grandma was right next to him and kicked him out of her house quickly after realizing what happened. Bro, my Lola would come back from the grave to hit your ass with coke and spill milk on your floor, my god! During this event, I realized that John and Jerry are talking and laughing and I think nothing of it, just concluding that they find the game fun. Break ends and the game somehow resumes. Jerry tells me he wants to enter a drinking contest to make some money. In this rule set I made, barbarians are immune to alcohol, so his little girl won without much effort. He then tells me that with his money, he wants to buy new clothes because his old ones are burned. And after that, he tells me how his little girl goes to the nearby forest, removes all her clothes and starts bathing at the river. At this point, I'm really uncomfortable, but I did tell him that washing himself was the way to get rid of the poison, so I let it go. Then comes John's turn. He asks me if he can go to the river and I say yes, not knowing where he was going specifically. He then tells me th the 10 year old girl's body around. <sighs> Are you guys trying to get me in trouble? FBI, open up! With that being said, he wants to, how can I say this? He wants to fade to black the little girl with no regard to the girl's consent and the scene isn't really fading to black at all. I'm shocked. I asked Jerry if he's fine with it and he tells me, oh, we talked about it during the break. As a player, I'm fine with it, but my character isn't. This will be a plot point later in her character development. So 
that happens. John and Jerry both describe how John helped himself with that 10... And conveniently after, my three-hour alarm rang, so I ended the session then and there. After the game, Max told us his grandma didn't like the milk and didn't ban us from her house. I felt so overwhelmed by the game. I just ended the whole campaign. I only picked DMing back up three years ago, and now I'm the happy DM of a wonderful party of five players. My god. Hey, you know that consent meme where there's two people consenting to a relationship, but then Jesus puts himself in the middle and says, I don't consent? Honestly, that kind of applies in tabletop. Look, two people can consent to something, but the rest of the group is still there. They might not be okay with listening to these two people describe their quote-unquote scene. I've literally read entire essays that grown-ass men have written about how be an accepted part of every game for character development reasons, but their argument just falls apart when you realize that just because they like that content doesn't mean that everyone is going to. It needs to go beyond two people. It needs to extend to the whole group. Now, the writer is correct. You did enable this, and I don't think you need to go as far as to ban all intimacy from a table, but I do think it is reasonable to avoid this kind of content if you're not comfortable with it. Just because Jerry and John, the two people involved, like this stuff, doesn't mean everyone else is going to. When there's more than two people involved, you need more than two people consenting. Hey, that's a wrap. If you guys enjoyed this, you might enjoy our last episode a little bit about somebody who wanted a medieval setting that's just racism and homophobia. It's linked up in the cards. But before you go, please do leave a like on this video and subscribe to Crispy's Tavern so you don't miss any of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down in the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment. How is that creepier? To let me know you made it to the end of the video. Hey, by the way, if you have your own horror stories, you can send them directly to us. There's an email down in the description down below. Send your stories our way for a chance to be featured in one of these videos. By the by, if you keep it shorter, you have a really good chance of getting it, let me tell you. But anyway, whether or not you have any stories, in essence, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.